You know what they say? That which does not kill us makes us stronger. Hey y'all, welcome back to my channel. Hope everyone is doing well. So today we have a book review. It's been a while since I've done a book review. Did I like this book? No. No, I did not. There's my review. Thank you for coming to my TED talk. Okay, just kidding. Uh, let's get into it. Hugh Beaumont, actor, minister, best known as Ward Cleaver on a little television show known as Leave it to Beaver. You may have heard of it, I don't know. You know, Beaver, a teacher once said something to me that I think you'd do well to remember. As you go through life, try to improve yourself, not prove yourself. Mr. Keith Alexander and I fangirled and fanboyed over Hugh Beaumont one time when I was on James Edwards' political cesspool radio program. Did you know that Hugh Beaumont was from Memphis? I did. Did you know he was a preacher? Yeah, his father was a Methodist preacher. He went to Tech High School in Memphis. Oh, we got to get Lacey and Keith together. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I, I really He's think so that Hugh Beaumont was the quintessential 50s father. Hugh Beaumont was married to a woman named Catherine Adams, born Catherine Hahn. Adams was a stage name as Catherine was an actress. That was before she quit acting and gave up herself and live streamed to be a psychiatrist who raised her children at home. If you've read the feminist propaganda book, The Awakening, you pretty much understand Catherine Adams, except Catherine didn't kill herself by weighing herself down with rocks and walking into the ocean, but I'm getting out of myself. To understand Catherine Adams, you must understand her mother, Anna Marie Kahn. Anna Marie was a Methodist minister's wife and mother to six children, three stillborn. Anna Marie seemed to be the quintessential preacher's wife. I've seen it before in my own family, having quite a few preachers on my dad's side. Anna Marie was the homemaker, the nurturer, and the caretaker of not just her own home, but the extended community of church and charity. She volunteered at the Central Wesleyan Orphans Asylum in Minnesota, where Catherine grew up, and according to Catherine, got very close to the orphans there. Anna Marie, the way Catherine Adams writes her at first, is a strong woman, stern, physical as she's running a house, and always busy at work, even crocheting when she's sitting or in transport. Catherine describes her mother as a disciplinarian. In chapter 4, Catherine describes a scene from early childhood, a birthday party she attended where her mother insisted she take a nap before the event. Little Catherine refused to go before the party, so Catherine's mother refused to let her go to the party, and that was until her dad came in and gave little Catherine a talking to and permitted her to go to the party. Catherine writes, My father takes me to the party. I don't remember anything about it. What I did remember was that my mother had almost robbed me of my very first children's party. Catherine writes at the beginning of chapter 5 about her mother. She was a kitchen, food, and sewing person, there to help me dress, to comfort, feed, and scold me. My father was more of an idea than a solid human being. He was gone much of the time. Catherine often describes her father as a dream, something not yet there in the material. She writes in the same chapter from the perspective of a little girl. I watch the towering man in the pulpit above me. I watch every move he makes. He is standing there tall and stately with the light from the stained glass window above the altar shining down on him like a holy halo. To Catherine, her father Christian was a man with a reputation. Everyone knows the preacher. The preacher almost carries a legacy that is foreign even to the family as it often doesn't reflect reality. Again, I have experience with this. When someone puts your family member on a pedestal, you begin to see a pedestal there and they almost become less human and more of an idea, someone to represent holiness. Her father also represented her intense need to get a higher education, which is odd to me because even though she ultimately reclaimed her love for academics and psychology and philosophy, she had this whole other life as an actress and mother before that. She obviously made the choice for some reason, but she downplays those deliberate life choices and just tells the reader that she couldn't get out of her head, her father saying, finish your education. Catherine even said of her own acting career, acting wasn't something I longed for, it just happened. Catherine was in her sophomore year at Hamline University in St. Paul, Minnesota, singing for the choir when her call to Hollywood came. 
It was a literal call. She had entered a radio contest and didn't even consider the possibility of winning, but when she did, the small town farm girl packed up her bags and moved to Hollywood. She hadn't planned on becoming a big movie star, even after meeting with big shot producers, directors, and even starring in a movie with Ginger Rogers titled Fifth Avenue Girl. Catherine knew the whole time she would go home and finish her education. So what made her stay in Hollywood? Her father passed from a long and difficult illness, and guess who showed up and showed interest when she needed a father? figure the most. Tall, handsome, and holding a scotch and rocks, which Catherine thought was very mature while she was drinking her own 7-Up. Hugh and Catherine were involved in the same radio contest, and he informed her that he was intending to stay in Hollywood, and if she were to stay, he would protect her from the Hollywood wolves. She writes in chapter 3, Hugh, with his archetypical fatherliness, took on the role of father protector for me, a much needed and longed for role since the illness and death of my own father. She writes again in chapter 9, I needed fatherly protection and advice, and readily accept all he had to offer. He also told her she looked good in heels, which I can relate to the swooning a country girl from a small town would feel at being told she looks good in heels from this man she met in the big city. Now remember, to understand Catherine, you must understand her mother. Her mother advised her to not get married, that she would have no life of her own and no freedom. But she did apparently sit down with her daughter and also advised her to not wear herself out too much with housework so that she could be intimate with her husband. This was a mistake Anna Marie felt she made and urged her daughter not to neglect Hugh. So there are some mixed messages throughout the entire book of how Catherine feels about her parents, how her mother felt about Catherine's marriage, how Catherine felt about her own marriage. So Hugh and Catherine began dating. She writes in chapter three, Hugh liked ideas as did I. He liked to discuss everything from politics to religion, and in this, I believe he found me a lively partner. I can relate to this. If you haven't seen my video of the my courting story, check it out. I had a similar older man interested in politics and religion love story. Catherine and Hugh married on Easter Sunday in 1941 and had three children, Hunter, Mark, and Christy. Hugh eventually landed the role of Ward Cleaver, the most iconic TV dad to date. He also worked as a Methodist minister. Having his own church for four years, he gave that up to do youth outreach in LA. Hugh also eventually became a Christmas tree farmer. None of this, though, I found out through reading Catherine's book. If you're picking up Becoming the Mother of Me to learn any behind the scenes info on Hugh Beaumont or anything about their marriage between Catherine and Hugh, you, you will be disappointed. In fact, if you're not interested in women's issues and the Jungian psychology that convinced Catherine to divorce her husband after 33 years, you will find the book a complete bore. Unless you are a huge fan of Catherine's short-lived acting career and pick up the book just because you love that barely famous Catherine Adams, you will find the book a snooze. Catherine assumes everyone is interested in how she got so flustered being a mom while Hugh was traveling for work and she ran back home to her mother and showed up with her children. Hungry? She assumes everyone is interested in how she told Hugh how she got her first period. I've been married for 11 years and my husband doesn't even know the story of how I started my period. <laughs> it's like when a movie spends no time building characters but they expect you to have some feeling when something happens to the characters, but you don't, so it's just flat. Whedon is an amazing writer and he breaks my heart over and over and over again, but Ultron wasn't it. Catherine eventually quit acting and became her mother in a sense. Housewife, minister's wife, mother, the mother of her. I'm reminded of that scene in The Horse Whisperer where Diane tells Annie that she's always known she was going to be a rancher's wife because she was a rancher's daughter. Did you always know this is the life you wanted? Well, I was a rancher's daughter. I guess it's not too far to go to becoming a rancher's wife. <laughs> But Catherine was not as thrilled to become her mother as Diane was in the movie. Catherine writes in chapter 20, Before the women's movement, women were patronized in sentimental Mother's Day acknowledgments, then railed against in mother hover smother diatribes, mourned for, longed for, and clamoring for stay-at-home mothers and family values. Women who dared venture into the masculine world endured the begrudging, often hostile remarks of men who felt forced to make space for them. She continues, Back then I was unconsciously caught in the same stifling net. My mother the king, my mother not the queen, but my servant. 
Anger at myself is rising as I remember my attitude in those days when I thought I understood it all and had no wisdom. Catherine did finish her education like her father wanted her to. She went to school for educational psychology and earned a master's degree. This is when Catherine Adams went back to work and a children's therapist this time. Then tragedy struck the Han Beaumont family. En route to visit Hugh in LA from the family's home in Minnesota, Catherine, her children, and her mother were in a terrible car accident. The son, Hunter, was banged up, but all right, but Anna Marie was ejected from the car and killed. Reportedly, Hugh blamed himself and sunk into depression the following years. Co-stars on Leave it to Beaver noticed the sadness in Hugh returning for the second season of Leave it to Beaver that wasn't pre present in the first. According to many, Hugh never forgave himself for that accident, but not according to this book. We don't, we don't learn anything about how Hugh Beaumont felt at any point in time. <laughs> during the, in this book. Now, Catherine was not just fatherless, but also without a mother. She turned her analyzation inward toward her marriage and found it lacking. All of Catherine's pursuits for happiness never resolved her issues with her parents, and now with them both gone, Catherine was unhappy yet again. In chapter 20, Catherine wrote, Because of unease about my marriage, I had recently begun to work with a Jungian analyst and was beginning to be aware that something more powerful than mother-daughter rivalry was stirring within me. Realizations about my mother were coming alive. Mama felt expendable, a burden. Catherine goes on to imagine what career her mother would have had she been encouraged to as a woman were encouraged to after the women's movement, also known as second wave feminism. So with the help of Young and feminism, Catherine knew what she had to do and ended her 33 year marriage to Hugh Beaumont. Again, there's no juicy details, no Hollywood gossip, not even Hugh's side of the story, no defense at, of Hugh at all. She even states once in the book that he was a better father to the boys than to their girl because he didn't take the girl fishing like he took his sons. The book ends with letters from Catherine to her parents apologizing for not realizing their worth while they're here. The book is a dry read if you aren't a fan of Catherine Adams or, or interested in why women divorce their husbands. Even though the book jacket uses Hugh Beaumont's name to sell the book, obviously. There is very little written about him at all. Catherine went on to marry Fred Doty. The couple stayed together until his death in 2011. Catherine passed in 2016. While the book was a very hard read, I find the tragedy of Hugh and Catherine's story an important one. I have made the claim that Jungian psychology and feminism ruins marriages and lives. The story of Catherine Adams could be a case study on why that happens. Catherine describes her spiritual awakening, her connection to Mother Earth, her archetype as a Demeter, and remembers fondly while her family growing up was religious, they were also liberal and modern. Catherine had no real foundations to walk through struggles as a wife and a mother, so she had to define herself, capital S, the only way feminism told her how to, apart from roles of wife and mother. I don't agree that it's important to find yourself outside of being a wife and mother. Many women who lose their husbands or their children grow up and they are left with an empty nest turn into Titus II women and turn their love towards younger women in need of guidance and turn their outreach to the church. Finding yourself is not necessary. In fact, it's unbiblical. And Catherine Adams shows us why. On that somber note, I hope you liked this video and hope you will join me in the next video where I will give a review of a book I actually did like. I can review things I do like. See y'all later. Bye.